In recent history, the FAA has required an anomaly investigation for SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket on two separate occasions. When are they going to do the same for Starliner? Well, that's actually a good question, and a lot of you have been asking that in the YouTube comments. We do read the comments. And at first, I didn't know the answer, so I sat down with the FAA to help unravel the process. It's not the entire FAA that we're talking to. That's not how it works. But we've actually got Dan Murray, who's the executive director with the operation of operational safety. Dan, that's a mouthful. What does that actually mean? Like, what do you do with the FAA? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and, and your listeners. Uh, so I, uh, I, I'm with the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation. Uh, we're one of several what we call lines of business within the FAA. Uh, we serve as regulators uh, in this uh, instance to the commercial space transportation industry. Uh, and the way we go about doing that is by uh, issuing licenses uh, for commercial companies to launch or re-enter uh, their vehicles or to operate a site. You could tell I, I had my interview headset on. So let's hop right in. On July 11th, SpaceX's Falcon 9 was grounded after a problem with the second stage ended up in the loss of the mission. Now, the time out already. We're, we're apparently not supposed to use the term grounded. We hear from time to time, sometimes in the media, that a, a rocket is grounded. Uh, that's more of an aviation term. Um, you know, we don't have fleets of rockets like there are fleets of uh, certain types of aircraft. Um, and we don't ground, but what we do do is we hold on to the license while the investigation proceeds. Um, there's a chance that the investigation can, again, demonstrate that uh, safety was not, not in, in jeopardy in what, with what happened. And at that point, we can issue a return to flight. And we have done that a number of times. You may have heard of aircraft being grounded when there's a problem that prevents the entire class of aircraft from flying. But if it's not grounded, what's it supposed to be for rockets? To try and figure it out, I actually pulled up Title 14, Chapter 3, Commercial Space Transportation for the Federal Aviation Administration. I searched for the word ground, and I found ground trace, ground service equipment, ground safety analysis, grounding when it comes to electronics and lightning, but I didn't find anything that used the word ground, grounded, or grounding in reference to stopping a rocket from flying. I can put a link in the description if you want to search for yourself. So I actually backed out to Title 51 of the U.S. Code, Section 509, which establishes the FAA's ability to do these things. And I found the Secretary of Transportation may prohibit, suspend, or end immediately the launch of a launch vehicle. Well, none of those said grounding, and I eventually found myself thinking no disassemble afterwards, but that's a whole other story. So I reached out to the FAA for clarification, and they told me the launch provider may not return to flight. Now, what's the real difference between not being able to return to flight and being grounded? I don't know. But if I keep saying grounded in this video, please forgive me. It's just because I don't have a better term to use, and that sort of sums it up in one easy word. The rocket can't fly. Or more specifically, the rocket's not allowed to fly. Anyways, back to that Falcon 9 anomaly in July. After the anomaly investigation was initiated, SpaceX returned to flight on July 27th. That's an elapsed time of 15 days, 3 hours, and 10 minutes liftoff to liftoff. It's pretty fast. When they returned to flight, they were able to do so because of a FAA public safety determination, which basically just determined that the public safety wasn't in jeopardy due to that anomaly, so they could continue flying while they continued the investigation. And as far as I know, that mishap investigation is ongoing. But then again, on August 28th, a landing anomaly grounded Falcon 9 again. In that instance, Falcon 9 returned to flight two days, 23 hours, and 55 minutes liftoff to liftoff after the anomaly. <laughs> and you thought two weeks was fast. Now, the same thing there. The public safety determination found that the public wasn't really unsafe due to that anomaly, so Falcon 9 could very rapidly return to flight. And that brings us to Starliner. On June 5th, Starliner launched for the third time, this time with crew aboard. During this mission, Starliner encountered all sorts of problems, primarily with the thrusters, overheating and seals not working the way they're supposed to. The purpose of this video isn't to dig into the details of Starliner's problems. We'll all agree it had problems that need to be figured out. Now, even though there were crew aboard, Starliner got the astronauts to the International Space Station just fine, for certain values of fine. I mean, the astronauts themselves were okay. So even though they made it there safely, with the problems that occurred and the lack of explanation on exactly why those problems occurred, NASA felt like it didn't need to take the risk and send the astronauts back down to Earth on the Starliner. 
And I can tell you, um, when you push the edge of the envelope again and you do things with spacecraft that have never been done before, just like Starliner, you're going to find some things. And in this case, we found some things that we just could not get comfortable with uh, putting us back in the Starliner when we had other options. So Starliner, with no astronauts aboard, undocks from the ISS and returns to Earth safely at White Sands Space Harbor. Now, again, there were a couple problems on the way down, some more thruster problems, an issue with a navigation reboot or loss of signal, which can be pretty important for a spacecraft that's trying to land, but it did come down just fine. So even though Starliner made it back, given the fact that it left the astronauts on the space station and had all these issues over the course of the mission, is Starliner going to be grounded? I mean, there were no people aboard the Falcon 9s, and it couldn't fly, but Starliner had crew aboard. What's going to happen? Well, top of the pile, one of the big things that you might realize is the difference between the rocket and the spacecraft. In the case of Falcon 9, Falcon 9 is the launch system, and Dragon is the spacecraft that is launched by that launch system. For Starliner, Atlas V was the launch system, and Starliner was the spacecraft. So there's an important point here about where specifically the problem occurred. Was it the launcher, or was it the spacecraft? In the case of Falcon 9, both problems were with the launch system itself, either the second stage, which puts the payload the rest of the way into orbit, or the first stage, which on occasion returns back to the launch site. So we really need to understand what's going on with those landings. In the case of the Starliner, the issues were firmly on Starliner's side, not on Atlas V. So in this case specifically, Atlas V wouldn't be affected, but Starliner might be. On the flip side, if Falcon 9 is grounded, realistically, Dragon is also grounded. And that's not for any licensing or regulation reason, it's just because Dragon is only designed to launch on Falcon 9. So in this case, a problem with a launcher could affect the ability to launch a spacecraft. All right. Beyond that, I think we can all agree that launching rockets safely is a very important thing. So the question becomes, who is responsible for the safety on any given launch? And that actually comes down to who the launch is for. In the United States, it could be NASA, it could be the Department of Defense, or it could be the FAA. I mean, the FAA comes right out and says the FAA does not license launches or reentries by and for the United States government. Now, this goes all the way back to 1984 when the Commercial Space Launch Act began to separate the concept of commercial launches from governmental launches or, or military launches. In fact, the first commercial launch was in 1989. It was a Starfire suborbital vehicle that was licensed there. But if you look at the big NASA launcher that operated all those years, the Space Shuttle, none of the Space Shuttle missions were managed by the FAA. They were all managed by NASA. In some military satellites, like spy satellites, NROL, that sort of stuff, you'll see actually get the responsibility from the Department of Defense. So this was all fine in the 90s and 2000s when the launch cadence was sort of like doing its thing. But look at today, where the launch cadence has literally gone in the stratosphere. I mean, technically goes through the stratosphere, but whatever. The important thing is that somebody has to be responsible for making sure we're doing the launches in a safe manner. But does it actually happen this way? Well... You can look for yourself. If you look down in the description or over in the comments, you'll actually find a link to the FAA's Commercial Space Transportation data website. You can click through it yourself. You can look through all the different licenses and counts and stuff all the way back to 1989 through the present launches that are launching right now. So let's go through an exercise here. You can do it yourself or, or I'll do it here. Look through the web page and see if you can't find Inspiration4. It's pretty solidly commercial space mission, right? There it is. You can see that it was licensed by the FAA. All right, let's try a crew mission like SpaceX Crew 7. Also there, licensed by the FAA. But wait, you might say, wasn't that a mission for NASA? Good point. Hold on, we'll explain it. Now let's look up Dragon Demo 1. Is Dragon Demo 1 in this database? It's not. That one wasn't licensed by the FAA. So some things we can talk about there. But first, let's mosey on over and look at the re-entries. Yep, the re-entries are there as well. Can you find Starliner there? Nope. But how about Polaris Dawn? There it is. But here's a real doozy, right? Remember the crew capsule Orion? It's supposed to fly on SLS, go around the moon, part of the Artemis program. But its first demo flight 
wasn't actually a board SLS. It was on a Delta IV Heavy. Do you think that's going to be on the list or not? Interestingly, even though this Orion flight was aboard a United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy rocket for a NASA mission, it was a commercial provider testing a system that they would use for NASA. It wasn't actually for NASA, so that one was licensed by the FAA. Take a minute and think about how that would apply to maybe Starship and its role in the Artemis program. So anyways, by clicking around the FAA website, you can, you can see what launches and what re-entries they're actually licensing and ones you might think would be in there that aren't actually in there because somebody else has responsibility for the safety on that mission. Plus, it's kind of cool to see the increased launch cadence, the little ramp on the graph there at the end in recent years. As a space fan, it's nice to see. Now, I will point out that even if the FAA doesn't license a launch, they still help with the launch process. I mean, think about the, the notice to air missions and clearing the airspace so that maybe a NASA licensed launch can launch through airspace that's been cleared by the FAA, even though the FAA is not licensing that mission. So they can still be involved and they can still assist with the launch process, even though they're not the ones sort of in charge of the safety. In fact, they actually said uh, FAA does provide airspace integration for launch and reentry as we do for all licensed and non-licensed space operations occurring in the U.S. national airspace system. Sounds very official. But it's a whole thing making sure commercial flight patterns aren't going through launch zones when it's time to launch rockets. But that leads me to a really interesting question. If somebody needs to be responsible for safety, and it can be NASA, or it can be the DOD, or it can be the FAA, who gets to decide... I mean, does NASA just roll up and say, nah, we got this, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and certify this one? Well, actually, yeah, that's kind of how it works. The top-level agencies, NASA and the Department of Defense, sort of have like a first option to, to sponsor or take responsibility for the safety of a launch. And if they don't take that responsibility, then it falls to the FAA to make sure that somebody's on the watch looking out for public safety. But don't take my word for it. Here's Dan from the FAA helping explain it to me. Basically, the question comes down is, who is, is overseeing the public safety? Uh, we don't need duplication. We don't need multiple agencies all looking at the same thing. Only one agency needs to do it. And DOD can do it. NASA can do it. We can do it. Um, but there's kind of an agreement with regard to the way the service is being procured, where we decide it's, oh, it's commercial, it's FAA, or it's not going to be commercial, it's, it's DOD or NASA. Does NASA get to decide, like, okay, no, this is a NASA rocket. We don't need the FAA for that one. Or do they ask the FAA, hey, do we need you for this one? Like, who makes that decision ultimately? It's the DOD or, or, or NASA um, deciding very early on, usually, uh, in, the, in the life of the program, uh, that they either want to be responsible for the safety oversight of it or, or they're willing to, to let uh, the FAA do that. Now, if you keep digging around for regulations, you might find some things that are sort of outside the, the focus of this video. Like, did you know that in order to be the pilot of a spacecraft, you actually need to have a pilot's license with an instrument rating? And also, the FAA has some regulations around making sure that uh, passengers are trained on safety systems if they're riding aboard a spacecraft. But the thing I want to focus on is who's responsible for looking after the safety. So let's dig into some specifics, right? Let's go over to the Dragon demo flights. If you look at these, the first demo flights were all under NASA's responsibility. I mean, Dragon Demo 1, back in March of 2019, was an uncrewed test flight that was sort of sponsored by NASA. Moving on to Dragon Demo 2 in May of 2020, that one had crew aboard, but it was still under NASA, not the FAA. And then you reach the third flight of Dragon, Crew 1, the first operational flight of Dragon. Now here, NASA actually made a specific point of pointing this out in a press conference. The, the big milestone here is that we are now moving uh, away from development and test and into operational flights. Uh, and in fact, uh, this operational flight was licensed by the FAA. So this is uh, truly a, a commercial launch vehicle and we're grateful to our partners at SpaceX for providing it and our partners at the FAA for licensing it. And from there on out, all of the operational missions of Dragon were licensed by the FAA as commercial missions with NASA as the customer, not as NASA missions under NASA's safety authority. I mean, Crew 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., but also the Axiom missions, Inspiration 4, and Polaris. And this is intentional the way the commercial crew program is set up. NASA takes responsibility during the early demo experimental missions, but then when the spacecraft system moves to an operational status, they give that to the FAA to continue commercial operations where NASA is just another customer. 
It's actually why they set up the whole commercial crew idea this way. I mean, hey, make a spacecraft. We'll help you get it started. Sell it to other people and sell it to us, too, to help drive some costs down. We'll just be a customer for you. And you see SpaceX doing exactly that, which you love to see. Now, time out, you may say. Some of those Dragon missions had issues. Well, that might be true, but none of the issues rose to the level of requiring a mishap investigation. So even though Dragon is operating commercially, you haven't seen any anomaly investigations required for Dragon to date. So to sum it up, NASA helped Dragon get going, and now SpaceX offers Dragon to other entities as a commercial service. It's fantastic. I just wish that I could afford one. <laughs> all right, that's all great, but where are we with Starliner? Starliner's on Flight 3. By Flight 3, Dragon was operating as a commercial spacecraft. But remember, the first Starliner flight had some pretty big problems. Back during OHT-1 in December of 2019, Starliner was uncrewed, but it had some massive problems with a disagreement in the clocks that kept it from reaching the International Space Station. In fact, NASA was on the hook for safety there, and they required another flight uncrewed out of Starliner before they would proceed with the program. That occurred in May of 2022, and it made it to the International Space Station without crew, but it was plagued with thruster problems as well. So fast forward to June of 2024 when NASA authorized the crewed flight test for Starliner. That's when Bush and Sonny went up to the International Space Station, but once again, Starliner had thruster issues. Remember, NASA's still on the hook at this point. They have not certified Starliner for commercial operations. The FAA hasn't commercially licensed Starliner or licensed Starliner in any way, shape, or form. It's all still NASA. So even though Starliner made it all the way back home, ostensibly safety, and could have carried astronauts, this is still on NASA. NASA hasn't certified Starliner for the next step. We don't even know what NASA is going to require out of the next flight of Starliner. But the important point is, the FAA hasn't licensed Starliner. It hasn't even made it to those commercial licensing gates yet because it hasn't completed a successful mission under NASA's guidance. I mean, will NASA actually certify Starliner to move forward? As of right now, that's unknown. There's been no official statement as to whether or not NASA is going to require another flight or move into the next phase. Who knows? I think the timeline is a little bit... Uh... It, we're going to take our time to figure out what we need to do to go fly Starliner 1, right? Um, it'll take a little time to lay that out and then get into the testing. And then, you know, I, I think we'll see where we're at in another month or so. And then we'll have a little bit better idea of what the overall schedule will be. So when, or more likely if, Starliner actually moves into an operational or commercial phase, it's going to have to go through all of these same gates and all of these same hoops to get a commercial license from the FAA. And I really don't see that happening until NASA certifies it. I mean, NASA needs to be happy with it as a spacecraft before anybody else should be happy with it. But in any event, I'm not entirely sure we're going to see customers banging down Boeing's doors asking for commercial flights on Starliner. But the important thing here, why did the FAA require anomaly investigations for Falcon 9 on two separate occasions, but we haven't heard a peep about them requiring an anomaly investigation for Starliner, is because the FAA hasn't licensed Starliner in the first place. That still firmly rests on the shoulders of NASA, and we're going to have to look to them for the future of Starliner. So I hope that clears up some of y'all's questions down in the YouTube comments. I really do read through all the comments, and while a lot of the times the comments are pretty, <laughs> sometimes y'all have really good questions, and I want to go out and actually find the answers for you, because I get to learn as well. Quick thanks to our friends Maria and Alice over at the T-Minus Space Daily Podcast for coordinating the FAA interview. If you're looking for a daily dose of detailed news and insights on the evolving space market, check them out. There's a link down in the description. And also, big thanks to the FAA for actually sitting down and letting me just ask questions so that I could better understand this and share the information with y'all. My name is John Galloway for NASA Spaceflight, and I'll see you nerds later. Thanks for watching.